G'day everyone. This is the, the resurgence episode of what we used to call legal lowdown on the lockdown. We've gathered Dean Knight, Nessa Lynch, Eddie Clark and I in urgent fashion because yesterday there were drum beats of a constitutional crisis and we were very keen to discuss this momentous event that was about to occur in New Zealand, much anticipated but previously never eventuated and by the time we've now gathered noon on Monday there is no constitutional crisis it seems, surprisingly enough. But perhaps Dean can just take us through what the crisis was and why it's gone away or why we think it's gone away. Dean. Uh, the there is no constitutional crisis. There was no constitutional crisis. At best, there was a constitutional brouhaha, which turned out to be a complete fizzer. So this is all is about... That term, <laughs> is that a technical term, Dean? A constitutional so, brouhaha? So this is all about the election, which is a constitutional thing. Because we recall last week that the parliament was due to uh, dissolve on the Wednesday morning to allow the election. Um, and... That was delayed slightly when Auckland went into lockdown to get some breathing space for the PM to reflect on whether the election could go ahead regardless. And she timed her announcement on Monday, this Monday today that we're recording it, this episode, uh, to uh, tell us what she was going to do. And you know, to give away the ending, uh, the election's been delayed until uh, October the 17th, uh, four weeks on. But... Uh, over the weekend and early last week, there were lots of um, chatter and noise about uh, whether or the circumstances in which the PM was making the decision. And importantly for me, lots about the caretaker convention. And for me, that's what's been top of mind for this last week, about um, the nature of that caretaker convention in a situation that before an election... Uh, what are the scope of the PM's powers, including to advise or uh, request dissolution of Parliament for an election, uh, and, and, and what happens if she loses confidence of the House if her coalition collapses. So uh, if I perhaps deal with that first thing... Well, th perhaps just to, just to remind everybody who's listening, in theory, in our constitutional system, the Prime Minister advise the Governor-General, right, Dean, as to when the election will be called, so long as it doesn't go past the statutory limit on the term of Parliament. And so this election we were going to have in September was, I think, full two months before it actually needed to be held, when the expiry date of, the, of this Parliament would have occurred. We've got very used to New Zealand having very long tele telegraphing of when, in fact, there is going to be the election. New Zealand politicians on the whole don't play with the election date and the way that election dates are played with in the UK, for example, um, in terms of politicians wanting to call elections when they think there's an electoral advantage. And we've always, almost always, gone to a three-year term. But there's been a sort of convention since 1984 that, in fact, we, tell us, we telegraphed this in a long way before. And, of course, 1984 being the key thing with some of us can still... Uh, just old, just old enough to remember um, the conditions under which the, the then Prime Minister Rob Muldoon called an election after a consultation period where he had consulted probably with himself, um, deciding that it was important to have an election. And since then, we've been very reluctant to go back to that. I think in New Zealand, it would be a bad odour to call an election just because it was politically convenient for you to yeah, do so. I, 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 a very important decision, but still formally a captain's call, no obligation to involve the House no obligation to consult the opposition, and it's not a decision which ordinarily goes through cabinet processes, it's a captain's call, but you're right, Jeff, that it's a, it's a precious decision, and one which is not gained, I think, is the way that we're thinking about it. And, and we can look at the last three or four elections, as you say, where we've, we've got months and months of notice, and there's a, the, the, some of us are wondering, is that now convention that, that at the beginning of the, the year, the Prime Minister signals when that election is going to be, giving some certainty and some fixed dates? So it's sort of a de facto uh, fixed date uh, election thing. But because of the rise of the alert levels, we thankfully things are not set in stone. We have the ability, or the PM had the ability to revisit that because the proclamation dissolving parliament had not been read out on the steps of 
Parliament, which is where it then becomes implemented or posted in the Gazette, um, the, the Prime Minister was able to revisit that and give updated advice to the PM. I think the Governor General. And it's a matter, but it was a matter of one day. This, if this had happened yeah. two days later, that is actually the point at which the date becomes fixed. This wasn't the, the announcement that the Prime Minister gave earlier in the year doesn't actually have any legal relevance. It no. didn't set the date. So the, the poor old herald of arms would have already sh shined his shoes here, getting ready for his or her great moment in the <laughs> sun on the steps of Parliament, and was denied that by twelve by twelve by literally minutes, probably, by the time... Well, I, I checked and the table wasn't out there half an hour before it turned it out, <laughs> which was a good sort of... Hint. So, that's the, so that's the background to this, and that's... So that the, the decision was, was made, but there were two constitutional aspects to that. One, one was that some... The, the opposition wanted to be involved in that decision, and secondly was this very odd letter written by the Deputy Prime Minister to his boss, um, hinting, not hinting in the way the Deputy Prime Minister often hints, that he would like the election to be put back quite considerably. Yeah, can I deal with the first one first? Because that's that's a bit longer, a bit fatter too, because the, the, the leader of the opposition has been trying to get involved in decision-making, whether it be alert levels, whether it be um, uh, election decisions, those types of things, trying to argue that before the election, because the House was due to sit, that um, there was some sort of practice or convention that the the, the Prime Minister needed to uh, consult with the opposition about important decisions or positions, um, uh, decisions which might have a light beyond the election. And what we learnt is, uh, by looking at the box in the Cabinet Manual, uh, is there no, is no such convention. There is no such obligation in law or in convention for the Prime Minister to, convert, uh, uh, to consult with the Leader of the Opposition and other parties about major decisions like alert levels just because we're close to an election. Position changes at election when the post-election caretaking convention bites in, but as it stands at the moment, no such convention uh, uh, beforehand. Yes, a question about whether it might make sense for such a um, convention to be developed, but there's a really good piece from our colleague Professor Claudia Gleiringer on spin-off actually engaging in that normative debate. But I think the important thing for us was is that as it stands, uh, the the PM still has unfettered ability to make any decision, whether it be alert level decisions or uh, uh, setting the date of the election. Um, prior to election, uh, they have that ability, except, and the except is important, except if the Prime Minister loses confidence of the House, so it doesn't have majority support from the MPs. And so there was lots of discussion over the weekend of that hypothetical scenario that Jeff alluded to about, well, what happens if New Zealand first didn't want the election to go ahead and wanted to delay, collapse the coalition, would that prevent the Prime Minister requesting dissolution um, of Parliament from, and what would the Governor-General do? Um, because if that confidence is lost, then the Cabinet manual and speech of the Governor-General make it clear that even that captain's call about where the election's going to be and disillusion of the Parliament to allow that, that would be constrained by the caretaker convention. So the PEPM wouldn't have that unilateral request. It would need to demonstrate that her decision carried majority support of the House. Um, and so, I mean, it, there was a lot of unpacking of that caretaker convention and, the, and, and what the uh, Governor General might do. But in the end, and I think rightly so, it ended up being complete fizzle. Um, and I think the PM took the political heat out of this uh, situation by, in her announcement today, drawing on very strong democratic values and those, uh, the importance of legitimacy of the, uh, the election date and not gaming it. When she stood up at the podium and says, this is not an ordinary decision to be making setting the election date in these circumstances, I reached out to the other parties and other non-parliamentarians um, uh, to take soundings. So she's recognising that, that, that important... That, but that to be fair, one gets the tone that actually that sounding was somewhat um, rebuffed by at least the leader of the opposition who um, has not endorsed the, decision, the, the date decision now. Um, and one, sen one sentence uh, was the reaction I saw, which was, I acknowledge the moved election date. Yeah, and, 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 and the problem when you're reaching out to multiple people, there's going to be multiple views. I think there, there was a, 
I, as I heard the, the Prime Minister, there was a, a, a clear preference away from the current date, that it was impractical or, or not ideal to stick to the existing date, the uh, September 19th date, and then the question of what the alternative one difference of view is that needs to be mediated. But I, I, I do think there isn't something, in, in, in the, the, the Prime Minister wasn't obliged to reach out and, and, and to have those conversations, and I think there is something, and in, in, there's a sense of a civic, sense of civic virtue or some values playing well, in there to say. But then, that's, then, but then that gets into what a convention actually is. So Claudia quite rightly says the limits the, the constitutional conventions in New Zealand to say that we don't have this, what is described somewhat unfortunately in the UK as PURDA yeah. in relation to um, not making decisions within a particular time before the UK election. But it seemed to me that you could argue that actually given the nature of the last 30 years in New Zealand's public life where we don't think it's okay for Prime Ministers to take a political advantage of setting election days, that actually we had something like a, a convention the difficulty here is that the election date is set. This is a decision to move the election date. Which Does that make a difference? The other thing, Dean, which I just wondered, was maybe rather than all this happening last week, it happened this week when Parliament has been dissolved, the writs have been issued, the formal instructions of the Electoral Commission have been issued, um, and then we, get, we all had the Tuesday night, we all had last week where suddenly we were told what we did, all didn't want to happen, it happened, and New Zealand's largest city, one third of New Zealand's electors, could not meet in public, which is, a, I think, a precondition for having a proper election. Well, yeah, and uh, we're reliant then on the emergency provisions in the Electoral Act to, to, um, to uh, defer the election week by week. Um, we, did, we did dive into the constitutional law textbooks to see if once Parliament had dissolved, whether it was possible to re-summons it or not. Sort of a ghost parliament. Well, no, 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 it was actually the un the un dead part, the un <laughs> un dead part. There was a genuine uh, difference of views about some of the experts about whether you could revive it or not. You could, certainly couldn't revive it after the election but this is because, because there's no, no MPs. But right? this is why this very peculiar thing in New Zealand where there are MPs after dissolution. So in the United Kingdom, as I understand it, there are no dissolved... There are, once parliament dissolved, there are no MPs. And I know this because everybody, all the MPs in the UK changed their um, Twitter handle yeah. to the former MP and the hope to be soon <laughs> MP of such and such constituency. But in New Zealand, we continued people being MPs because of Robert Muldoon in the 1984 crisis where he refused to follow the advice of, his, um, of the incoming government and the incoming government couldn't become the government because they weren't MPs, so we, we have this fiction that they continue on as MPs. Well, they continue until 7pm on a, on polling day, and ministers continue on for up to, I think, 56 days, I can't remember off the top of my head to, to, to deal with that problem, but but there is a question of once the institution of parliament, because remember, institutions of parliament, uh, you know, we have separate parliament, they're kind of discrete ones, we call them the 50 bloody blah, the parliament or whatever. So I won't ever remember. Yeah, I don't, yeah but, but the odd thing is the House continues in perpetuity even if Parliament dissolves. So it's a hard question. I'm glad we didn't have to resolve it. The, the other point you made, Jeff, about whether moving makes a difference, I thought it was interesting that Ardern in her press conference today essentially said that it did, that her reaching out to the civil society and to the opposition parties and, and the parties in her government was because it is a different thing to move an already announced election date than it is to uh, set the election date in the first place. And I, we're not certainly not at the stage of convention there, and I hope we don't have to revisit this again for quite some time, but it's interesting that she seemed to think that that was the particular practice in this particular circumstance. Nor do we want to move to the idiocy of the UK's oh, no. um, fixed-term parliament no. act, which they discovered actually was just terrible, and you couldn't actually have a fixed-term parliament because of contingencies like the government not having sufficient support in order to um, actually govern. The, the one thing I would say is that the fact that this decision was a captain's call and not a collective decision of cabinet did open up the space, if you like, for the possibility of the coalition to collapse. Because if, if obviously that negotiation of um, through cabinet would ordinarily make sure that, that, that there is support for the measure because it comes from the body which reflects at least 50% of the people in the house, 
subject to agree to disagree arrangements or something like that. So that was the big constitutional crisis that... Brouhaha, no crisis. <laughs> that that <laughs> never, never quite was. It was all very exciting. I've been trying to stay off Twitter, so I didn't learn all about this until this morning. Um, but by which time it was almost done. Um, but that's the big headline stuff. But what's been interesting over the last week or so since, since the press conference at nine o'clock, quarter past nine last Tuesday is we haven't been really focused on the legalities of the lockdown or what they actually mean for our friends in Auckland um, in the way that we were focused on the legalities in the preceding um, lockdown in, April, in, in March and April, which may mean that we actually have much more understanding of what's actually going on. There's still some obvious concerns in Auckland about butchers why but butchers can't open or why greengrocers can't open but supermarkets can't open um, but that's pretty much dealt with and if you look to the, the orders that have come through they're much more detailed even still I think than the orders that were made under the Health Act these are actually made under the COVID Response Act um, so there's no possibility I understand it, of a Baradale type action um, being t- taken to challenge the legality of these things so some of the rough edges not quite smoothed out as some people would want um, but Ness has been focusing, I think, a little bit more on some of the orders that have been made, in particular um, the quarantine orders. So, Nessa. Yeah, so, so as you say, Jeff, we've got a much clearer situation with the general um, level three and level two order. But what was interesting was that we went back to the section 71 of the Health Act that occupied us so much earlier in the year. Um, so the Director General made an, what it was known as an oral direction, which was subsequently published on the Unite Against COVID-19 website. And so this was directed at um, two particular workplaces where some of the uh, resurgent cases had come from. Um, so two, he, he made a direction to the people in two named workplaces, any visitors, um, any people who live with those employees or contractors or visitors, that they were to isolate at their usual home and not to go out until they were contacted by the contact tracing services. And so arguably this is a more conventional use of that um, quite controversial section 71F, um, which obviously occupied us all quite a bit earlier in the year. And just just to recap what was controversial (laughs) about that was rather than being focused on a particular Mm. person or a particular group of people, it was focused on all of us. So it was the persons in that were actually all the persons in New Zealand. Yeah, whereas this was much a much more specific use of, of, of the power, and obviously that's uh, forming quite the basis of the, the Borrowdale, um, which is under consideration at the moment. Um, so what we've heard as well, and obviously we haven't seen these orders because they were for very particular people, um, was that certain people who have returned a positive test and people who are living with those people um, have apparently been directed to actually quarantine in one of the managed isolation facilities, um, so I think notably the, the Jet Park in Auckland. Um, so we, we had a bit of debate before we started under what provision of the Health Act that would be. So we probably think that that's 71F as well. And um, so it's requiring those people to quarantine, but in a particular place. Um, and I think this has been a little bit controversial because apart from the people who've come in across the border, um, to our knowledge, no other positive cases um, have been actually t- not taken from their homes, but um, directed to go from their homes to a quarantine um, facility. So... Um, just hearing in the media this morning that um, particularly some Mali and Pacific organisations have raised concerns around stigmatisation, so making the point that earlier positive cases um, were not directed um, to do this, and um, the idea that because these people are from South Auckland community, we understand that they're um, Pacifica, that they're Māori, um, that they were being stigmatised in some way. Um, so. I, I think I heard in the media that the two Tokoroa cases um, that they hadn't been moved to a quarantine facility, but there had been kind of a partnership arrangement to get them a suitable home. Um, so a little bit of a different um, approach to what was done um, earlier in the year. And I suppose just, just leading into some points that Eddie wants to make, it's clear that there has been um, some learning from what's gone on in Melbourne and how quickly that spread. Um, and I know Eddie, you had some thoughts about uh, compliance, maybe, which would... Yeah, that. yeah. So uh, we've sort of seen some some media reports on minor non compliances going on in Auckland, but by and large, as with March and April, people seem to be um, complying with the the lockdown requirements. Um, but more than that, I'm interested in some of the level two and level three elements across the whole country. 
And something that was a big issue in the Borrowdale case was what was the government advising you it's a good idea to do and what were they telling you you have to do or there will be legal consequences. And uh, a good example of, of that contrast in the current situation is masks have not been made compulsory. We've changed the health advice on masks and there's a suggestion that particularly in Auckland, but also those of us in the rest of the country, if we're in places where we can't easily socially distance. I should say that this is being recorded at a massive table where we're all sitting two metres apart. Um, where you can't socially distance, you should wear a mask. But there's been no compulsion on that. Uh, and that's in contrast to uh, the use of QR codes, which, I mean, there is a significant argument that these should have been compulsory as soon as the app was released. Um, but they weren't, but they are now. I think it's until Wednesday. They had a week from the date of the order, which was Wednesday, to get the QR codes up. So now every business uh, is required to display um, QR codes for the COVID Tracer app. Um, and in terms of sort of compliance culture in New Zealand, I thought it was really interesting as well that uh, in a slightly New Zealandish sort of way, when it looked like everything was okay, no one was downloading and using the app, and now it's absolutely gone through the roof over the past four or five days, number of downloads and number of scans in, in premises, because that was the big problem, is that people were not, uh, even if they had the app on their phone, were not scanning it, and that seems to have gone up hugely. So I, I just think it's really interesting to see to what extent we're relying on the rules and to what extent we're again relying on the team of five million concept. But, but also I think this is really interesting for those of us who did sit through the most of the Borrowdale hearing is that Dean might want to comment on this a bit more but one of the things that really struck me was the contrast between what was being described as a public health approach and the legal approach and so one of the things that you know, Mr Borrowdale's lawyer particularly was focused on is why don't we just do this more legally why don't we? Why weren't we always just more definite about what people had to do or what they should do, what they could do? In our own podcast, the the, the lockdown podcast, we were we were very critical of that too in terms of why weren't we being very clear as to what people could do and what they what they shouldn't do and what what they could do if they really wanted to still do. And what was really, I think, the most important thing about that um, the hearing for me, the way it changed my understanding a little bit of what happened, was. The, Public health people didn't really believe in that kind of compulsion in many people, although the Act is, is, is full of compulsions, is about as compulsive as, as you can get. The people who are most likely to use the powers under it don't necessarily think that those are the most effective ways of actually getting people to respond properly. And so their whole mechanism in that first, first week, the first 10-day period of the lockdown, when none of us really knew what was going on legally, to be fair, was very much on trying to get people to do the right thing. And they thought that was the best way of getting people to comply. And as, as that 10 day period went down, that, that broke down somewhat when people began to question, why can't I go swimming? Why can't I go surfing? Um, the difference I think between that first 10 days and now is that there was, and I think entirely understandable, but there definitely was some fudging from government on, the, on their comms on what was the legal rule and what was the public health advice. Here, um, the Minister and the Director General have been much more clear on what the rules are and what the advice is. And I think that's something that they've also learnt from the previous experience. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a worry, though, at the moment, whether we're losing some of that cohesiveness. Like, we've seen a lot of um, the misinformation, I think, more than there was the last time. Um, like, I know Minister Hipkins referred to that specifically yesterday, which I thought was quite interesting, at the start of the presser before the numbers were given out, like making particular reference to a particular rumour. Um, and I wonder, certainly we've seen that, I think, in Melbourne on lockdown number two and in other countries as well, where there's been a resurgence that some of that initial cohesiveness um, that you know the team of five million, everyone in this together has has begun to disintegrate a little bit. Um, and Eddie and I discussed this earlier. Um, I had seen quite a lot of non-compliance around when I was around particular areas of Wellington and on the weekend. Maybe had been in more compliant places, but I thought it was um, 
that we may begin to see that a bit more. Um, just people are exhausted or they don't have that proximity to it anymore. Well, I'm wearing my mask when I go out for my coffee. And I mean, I, I'm with Jeff in terms of that ph uh, philosophy of, of the, the health officials. I mean, you've got to remember that the first bit of health advice was wash your hands. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to see that that's where the, the discussion of Borodell started and say, well, it was a little bit earlier than that, but wash your hands was the first one. Incrementally, it um, it ramped up with with better advice, more advice, and then if that wasn't working, then there and, and, and the case was made for a, a legal response that was proportional. That would be layered on. It was much more. Um, there was a sort of a theory in in play that was very different for those coming from a public health regime there than, as Jeff said, the lawyers that are looking for the legal commands from the sovereign about what to do. And, I mean, that's going to be a fascinating one to resolve, because we know that, I think, that, that after that hearing, that the first 10 days of that case, or oh, the first nine days of the lockdown... The hot ball of wax. Yeah, the ball of wax was just was just tricky. But but we're seeing, we're seeing that philosophy come through in, in, in the alert levels, as Eddie said, that are in place now. We can also see it spelt out if we want to look in parts 3A of the, the Public Health, uh, of the health Act, which is drafted with this philosophy of encouragement, proportionality, you know, an incremental approach which, as well. Which does get you back to the fact that there are two very different cultures going on in this statute and in this government response. One, the public health response, and which is in the public, in the, in the Health Act, and then there's a lawyer. You know, the public health people are officials. They're going to be thinking, how do good officials use these powers for good things to help New Zealanders get over this crisis? The lawyer response is always, how does the bad official, who's not trying to help the crisis, and but just being a um, sticky beak, how do we deal with those people? How do we restrict those people? And that creates a fundamental clash when you think about how you draft these statutes. Can, can I say, I wonder if the, if the reluctance of the public health officials to sort of immediately jump to compulsion might impact on some of the lack of testing around the border mm -hmm. and the and the and the marriage, managed uh, uh, quarantine because there's sort of there's a there is a friction going in there in terms of what's being directed and and what seems to be happening on the ground. On, on the flip side of that, though, um, I, I think it was um, Friday. Um, Dr. Bloomfield was asked at the press conference if cabinet had ever rejected any of his health advice, and he said, "What today?" <laughs> <laughs> because because you'll recall that his very initial advice was to lock citizens out of the country, just shut the border entirely. Yeah. Um, so there you've got more compulsion coming from the public health, but it's coming from a different angle. But also I think that uh, one of the things that's been obvious um, to me over the last couple of months is just not that we've got this legal public health dynamic, but also that's been mixed in with the political yeah. Yeah. thing. So the testing, like I'm not a public health expert, I'm not sure of the efficacy of testing all of the people that arrive in New Zealand. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. I don't know about the efficacy of testing all of the people who happen to work at the border at Auckland International Airport or at various ports around New Zealand. But as we move on, as people get longer in the teeth about and get more worried about particular ways this virus might get skirt through the defences, we're seeing more political restrictions. And so there wasn't actually a response when we found out about the lack of testing at the border from a public health perspective, really, or even legal perspective, it was just a political WTF, wasn't it? And then suddenly we were doing it. So there's a question there as well about whose fault this is and what the consequences of that should be. And um, I, I thought there was some good media digging to get out the fact that this regularity hadn't been going on. Um, but then we unfortunately jumped to where a lot of our media and political figures go, which is who should resign because of this. And that might, and it's a fair enough question to ask, and it might ultimately be where you end up. But I think it's really important, and this is something I think either in the very first or the second uh, Lowdown on the Lockdown podcast, the equation of accountability with someone resigning does no one any favours. And it's also not typically how it's understood in the public um, accountability sense and in the political accountability sense, at least as important, probably more important, are the obligation on the person in charge to explain what went wrong um, and to remediate what went wrong. And those obligations are in some ways incompatible with resigning, because if you resign, you just shuffle off and someone else has to deal with it. Um, so I, I think it's right to raise these questions about accountability and responsibility, 
Um, but it's an incredibly difficult situation where mistakes were inevitably going to happen. And having someone who pretty much everyone accepts has done generally a very good job resign because of it probably doesn't help anyone. But interesting in terms of that accountability, the focus is on remedying the problem and getting it and there's deadlines being set. Mm. And you know, and, 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 and Minister um, Hipkins as health minister is fronting that. What is kicking down the road at the moment is the obligation to explain, yeah. you know, or at least explain what we've done. And I'm still, I, I'm yet to draw an opinion because I want to know more. I want to know whether people are not being tested, are the people are washing the dishes mm-hmm. in the basement, or whether they're the, you know, the, the ones that are um, tackling people the people at the border. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah that was being done instead. I mean, there was talk of that they do get health checks, but Symptoms, they're not, yeah, yeah. not tested. And you're right, like, I didn't know these thousands of people who are working on the border, what are they doing? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, but interesting, there are just to maybe close off one of the other interesting things is we have two, at least two new personalities in that mix now. One is Dean's been or referring to Minister Hipkins, and the other thing is the now fact we've got a new National Party spokesman, Shane Reti, who was very, very interesting on Morning Report the, the other day when asked exactly that question: Why hasn't the government actually got this? Why, why are we always coming across these controversies? And he, I think, did a great job. I think all of us in the acad- academics would be very pleased with his reply, which was something along the lines of, it's a really complex problem. And I got the sense that he had the view that I have, which is kind of, this is like a whack-a-mole problem, that mm. we, as soon as you think you've got that tied down, something else comes up to bite you, because we've lived in a complex, interconnected society which prides itself on linkages with the world, and suddenly it's now the reverse, and we have to figure out how we basically disengaged from all of those things which have made our lives much richer over the last probably 150 years. And I thought his approach was obviously very different from the previous approach, maybe a little bit incongruous with some things his leader might have said, and certainly what his deputy leader said, but I think there was some really, that was a different nature of what it was to govern, I thought. It was a diff- and and the, on the uh, side of officials as well, I just, part of the, the comms going on here um, and the, a lot of these people feature in Nessa and Dean's COVID seminar that they're running at the moment. Um, having, having Minister Hipkins and uh, Andrew Costa as police commissioner, there's a real contrast, and it might just simply be the skills lie in different areas, between David Clark and Mike Bush at the start of this. Uh, the, the incumbents seem to be better at this sort of communication uh, than the officials we might have had at the start of, of this period. Although, although just to think too that obviously as the crisis goes on you need different skills so actually the Mike Bush will t- if you, we see you breaking the rules we're going to take you for a chat down to our place <laughs> might have actually been something that was useful in those first couple of despite the fact of you're very kind and understanding. Being <laughs> <laughs> an extra legal, but actually that may have been an important skill just at that moment. But I'll, but you can't keep that going over time because actually, as we now know, there was very little legal backing behind this invitation to Mr. Bush's house. <laughs> and we're entering an unknown phase. It's question time at two p.m. tomorrow, subject to what the business committee rules later on today. So we may see um, Hipkins being. Um, interrogated by um, uh, Reti in the, in the house again. I'm not sure how they're going to manage those um, those few weeks, extra weeks they've got. Um, Is there another adjournment debate? Do we get another oh, adjournment debate when it goes up the next time? <laughs> but even more importantly, what about those bills? There's at least two yeah. bills that I know of that failed to receive a first reading during the entirety of this term of Parliament. So um, I'm, for one, holding out for the non-autonomous sanctions bill, which has... <laughs> failed to receive any parliamentary time, maybe its time has come now. This is the bill dealing with how New Zealand the Institute's um, yeah. United Na- non-United Nations the, sanctions. The Youth Justice Demerit uh, bill, which I, I'd prefer if it didn't get a first read. I'm, I'm picking the secondary legislation bill will be um, will be back as, as a non-controversial sort of gap filler for the next week or two. I don't think the government's going to be pushing anything too this is, substantial, we, other than perhaps a, a, a amendments to the Electoral Act to better provide for emergency provisions in case of an election. The other thing I'd like them to see progress, which I probably don't think we will, is um, at the urging of academics, they sent um, the COVID public health bill to select committee for a report. That report is back. Uh, it didn't have the the usual second reading report with a marker, but it did recommend several changes, uh, which I think would improve the regime. And the government now has two weeks of 
something it needs to do in the house, so I think they should use that time to fix up the things that we all have spent a long time in these podcasts pointing out is wrong with them. Although, just looking up the, up the hill towards Parliamentary Council's office, I'm pretty sure that they are hoping that's not going to be the direction they're getting right this minute, Eddie. But having, having, perhaps that's a good place to end. We've now told other people to go and do lots of work, and we can, we can enjoy our um, semester break. Thank you for for listening and we'll be back with another podcast soon. Cheers.